Wait, how, how do you exactly pronounce your name? Hazem uh, Algabra. Okay. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Today we have the honor of speaking with Hazem Algabra, uh, born in Damas Damascus in 1983 uh, and moved to the United States in 1999, where he studied international politics and economics, began his career in 2003 as part of the team that started El Hara TV. In 2006, he joined the U.S. State Department, where he led various roles and became a senior advisor for public diplomacy in the Middle East by 2016. After leaving the government, he founded Frontiers Consulting Group and El Gabra Holdings Company, and he has became a member of the Republican Party in Virginia since 2001. So we'll start off right here. Who do you think won last night's debate, and what impact do you believe it will have on U.S. foreign policy? So last night, it was, it was an interesting evening. Um, I think the whole evening was uninspiring. Um, I was rooting for Trump. Uh, I was in a room full of people rooting for Trump. But I think, here's what I think happened. Um, following the or initial debate with uh, Biden and the lackluster performance of Harris uh, with uh, Dana Bash, uh, Trump came unprepared. Trump walked in for an easy win, and maybe it's pride. You know, it reminds me a bit of myself in high school when I showed up to exams unprepared. But he walked in thinking he got this. Uh, and Harris surprised everybody. Um, honestly, the bar was so low for Harris. So it was kind of easy for her to surprise. Uh, let me be nonpartisan here and tell you the problems. Um, for one, neither candidate seemed to have an agenda, a clear, obvious plan, uh, at least a 100-day plan. I think at this point of the campaign, we should have a very clear, very pronounced 100-day plan for the first 100 days of their presidency, whomever wins. That I did not find yesterday, or, you know, it was not mentioned. And worse, you know, what was it? You know the, the, the worst thing that happened yesterday, I think, that the nation figured out that we're in the we're well into the 21st century. We're in 2024 in the United States of America, and the public debate is revolving around Haitian immigrants eating cats, and that is a problem. That is a problem. I think yesterday, you know, it was for me less of a debate, more of a State of the Union uh, type of. Take a pulse check, and Dean, we got issues. We got issues. Yeah. So we'll move on to this. What do you think is the biggest challenge that the U.S. faces in the Middle East today in regards to Iran, Israel, and Saudi Arabia? So here's the thing. Um, following, you know, the war on terror, for the most part, you know, after 2003, 2004, we stopped being proactive in the region. So it's been two decades. We're, we're, we're... Hello, Moto. Walid? Yeah, I'm going to talk to you, Sadiq. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to talk to you. مين مع مين انت وليد؟ بي بي سي بي بي اه بي بي سي بي بي سي ساعة انتين قديش ساعة هلا؟ اي بعد 40 دقيقة تقريبا 40 دقيقة اي اوكي من اثنين لاثنين ونص طيب من عيوني انت ممثل انت 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 عضو في الحزب الجمهوري صح؟ صح طيب اوكي انتوا شو بتروحوا على المناظرة؟ اه مناظرة مناظرة اوكي طيب يا ولد معك ضد ديمقراطي اوكي؟ اي جبنا واحد نتسلى فيه يلا اول خير يلا سلام so sorry, no worries. Paid interview, so that that gets a little a bit of a priority. But let me turn off my ringer, so next time we don't have that problem. Uh, yeah, sorry again. If it, if it, if the ringer was not ringing, obviously I wouldn't have answered it, but that already ruined the thing. All right, so um, let's go back to this. So since two thousand three, two thousand four, for the past two decades, U.S. policy toward the region stopped being proactive and became very reactive. You know, we were involved in the war of terror, war on terror, and obviously we had, uh, you know, we we got a very bad taste from the region during those two decades. Uh, whether it's you know the Houthis, Iran in general, other issues, 
as you've noticed, we've been very reactive. You know, uh, we uh, we start losing soldiers in the region. We kill Soleimani. Um, there was there's a war. We get involved. Uh, our involvement has been limited uh, outside that. Uh, you know, th those. Uh, let, let me rephrase. So here's here's what you know defines U.S. policy um, in the region: opportunities and challenges. The level of opportunity or the level of challenge that we've been reacting to has changed the past two decades. And unless there is something major happening, we're not that involved. We're not. We're vocally involved. Where um, diplomacy is always active, but committing our involvement to more than an envoy uh, hasn't happened outside, you know, the war uh, in Gaza and other issues. Now, we the, this administration messed up royally at the beginning of the, in the first few months by alienating our allies our long-term allies, specifically Saudi Arabia, some of the UAE. And for whatever reason, reasons that were never explained, we're playing extra nice with Iran. It, it did not, that, that strategy did not work. And I think this is what happened, and this is, it's so unfortunate. We had, you know, the Obama deal with um, Iran, Everybody celebrated that deal, at least in the Obama administration. We thought it's going to lead somewhere. I was part of the administration back then. I had hopes. I was not convinced, but, you know, hope is good. Then um, the thing fails. Obviously, nobody admits to it failing. So they start blaming Trump for killing a deal that was, a, according to the Democrats, was a good deal. Unfortunately, they believed that lie and went back and said, like, oh, we, ha we had a good deal with Iran. Let's go and try to build it again. That was never a good deal. That was never a good deal. So here's the problem we're dealing with. We need to go back to priorities and basics. Saudi Arabia has been our long-term ally. We've been, you know, we've been intertwined as two nations in the, East, in the U.S. and the Middle East. For decades, um, we need to go back and reestablish these friendships before they lost forever. There, there is like there is a half life for a friendship. Once you ruin it, for when you can restore it, we need to restore these friendships. Uh, go back to clear definitions. We cannot be. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, the, the whole Her the thing with Harris that my values did not change, but my policy changed. That is the biggest problem we face in, in the United States because, hey, we have certain values that we communicate to other people. And when people expect us to act on these values, our policy that does not match. So, yeah, we, need, we have a lot of work in the region. Iran is the enemy. Not because we want them to be the enemy, because they want to be the enemy. Um, terrorism is real in the region. It's being funded uh, by individuals, groups, and governments. Um, the war on terror is not over, technically, because there are still active, very active terrorist organizations in the region. There's a lot of work to be done. And we need, honestly, the next administration, whomever it is, to address these issues in a serious way direct and final manner. Interesting. So how do you think this upcoming election, whether it be elected Kamala Harris or Donald Trump, impact the relations and the standings that exist today in the Middle East? So, you know, there are so many unknowns here, but we can safely assume that a second Harris, uh, like a second the Trump administration, will be a continuation of his policies during 2016 and, and 2020, and a Harris administration will be a continuation of the Biden Harris administration policies. Uh, if you look at the fruits of these um, administrations, 
in the region um, and with foreign policy in general, um, you can see that the Biden administration had some major issues enforcing U.S. will, if you may, or U.S. policy overseas, you know, from Ukraine to Iran to Gaza to Israel. You know, I, I don't see a lot of success. I, I, you know, if there was, trust me, if there was any success, we would have heard this administration continuously talk about it. Now, during the Trump administration, we, obviously we have to admit uh, there were, you know, outside factors. COVID took a, a, a chunk of, you know, the, um, the administrations, like the, the golden, you know, time of the administration where they can implement such policies. Uh, or like finalize uh, the, the implementations of policies, but we had at least you know for Israel and the Palestinian issue, we had uh, a a very lucrative deal for the Palestinian people that was able to create an economy that may lead to a two state solution. You know, it, obviously these things you know it's a it's an eight decade conflict. We can't expect Jared Kushner to go and fix it overnight, but there is something solid, something clear something defined there. And if you don't think that was worthy, well, let's talk about the uh, Abraham Accord. You know, that was for the first time, there was a glimmer of peace in that region. Um, we can talk about Ukraine. Um, obviously, you know, the uh, Trump administration was very clear. You know, there was like a, a, clear, a clear stick and carrot situation happening during the Trump administration. With this administration, it's like a big gray zone. And, and they're like, you know, there's so much happening in that gray area uh, that's creating the problems today. You know, there is no clear carrot. There is no clear stick. Nobody knows what they're going to get rewarded with. Nobody um, knows what the punishment. If we want to be an adult in this, you know, glo in global politics, then we need to be very clear with what we will do and what we will not do. That lack of clarity is the root of our problem today overseas. Interesting. So we'll move back to the topic of Israel and Gaza. How do you believe the U.S. should balance its relations and interests in the Middle East with its commitment to human rights and um, uh, democracy? It's an interesting question because, again, you know, you, we walk into that gray area. Um, you know, nothing, there's no, there's no command and control for the U.S. on the ground in that area. You know, the uh, conflict uh, between uh, Israel and Hamas has been managed wholly by Israel. We are not, we, we have assets on the ground, but they're not actively involved in the theater, if we put it that way. We don't know the casualties numbers, but we hear UN comes with their own number, Israel has their own number, Hamas has its own number, uh, you know, targeting the accusations against Israel and obviously and consequently the US role are not clear, um, you know, but that, put that aside, you know, here's the problem. There's so much noise happening, whether by U.S. negotiations, uh, by international courts, by other parties getting involved. The, Sp the Spaniards got involved at some point. Ireland is involved for whatever reason. South Africa, with these uh, you know ideas and, and 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 concepts that is are unenforceable and unnecessary, if you may. Um, what we need is to stop the noise, to reach an agreement to end the war. Because every time you will notice, every time there is a breakthrough in negotiations, for whatever reason, some random entity somewhere in the world will come and create this whole new process, whether it's a legal process or a political process, and derail these negotiations. We need to like, just get everybody to quiet down. And the U.S. needs to be a lot less eager because this is why I go back to what I started with. You know, the U.S. feels responsible for a theater and a war that it's not actively involved in. 
which is the first problem. It's a matter of perception, really, not a matter of activities. So we need to either find a way to end this work quickly by stopping all the noise, getting everybody involved on the table. And I think it's prime time to do that because Hamas lost the majority of its capabilities. If a shadow of Hamas to, uh, is to exist in the future, they need to find a solution now. Otherwise, you know, Israel will continue attacking. But also we're, we're forgetting some of our core values here. We are through, you know, indirectly or directly, well, however you want to look at it, Dean, we are fighting terrorism. Hamas is a terrorist organization. We cannot go back and say they're not just because they hide among civilians and they dig tunnels under um, uh, civilian areas. It doesn't change them. It makes them worse. It doesn't make them, you know, immune. Uh, it's, it's not a children's game. Like They literally are claiming immunity by hiding, by using humans as shields. The Israelis on the other side are also unclear about their objectives, about uh, the day after, about all these things that if they were clear about, maybe, maybe our involvement would be better. The international community's involvement would be better. And, uh, you know, maybe there is something that for people to rally behind. There's, un there's lack of clarity on the Israeli side. I don't think it's an intentional lack of clarity. I don't think they know what they want at this point. You know, there's the, the whole, like, you know, the thing that dangles, the shiny thing that dangles in the distance of ending Hamas and, like, rewriting uh, the map, or redrawing the map. Sure. But there's only immediate need for hostages to go back and the war to end. And between these two, the U.S., the, the Israeli policy that we've been supporting technically have, be have become very gray and unclear. And that needs to be resolved. But here, here's the thing. The U.S. looks eager to, you know, to get to a deal at any cost, at any price. And that is alienating everybody. We, 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 we kind of look weird. We look awkward right now. And that needs to be fixed so we can get back to a, a balanced negotiating table and we can get this war over with. Interesting. So we'll move on to something that I believe is very important, especially in this region, the Abrahamic Accords. How do you believe the U.S. could build upon them and try to encourage peace in the region while also fighting extremism and keeping good dip diplomatic ties? Um. I mean, the Abrahamic Accord was a, a project. It was an idea that led to a, I wouldn't call it peace because nobody called it peace. A, and nobody called it normalization either. Um, I think the term that was used is, it, it, the, let, me, let me rephrase this because I'm trying to remember, I'm trying to translate to Arabic. Yeah, okay. So uh, the Abrahamic Accords were, were a peace agreement. Were not, they were not normalization agreements. They were to end the state of war between these countries or the perceived state of war. But there's so much more work that needs to be done on top of that. And that work, unfortunately, requires U.S assistance or U.S. Uh, leadership, and that has been lacking for the Abrahamic. Uh, if you remember, the first couple of years of the Trump, of the Biden administration, they treated the whole thing as it doesn't exist. And that, you know, that uh, this is not only in the public eye, but also from friends and former colleagues uh, at the department, at the State Department, said, like, there's no support for the thing. It's dead in the water. The Biden administration doesn't want it because it's a Trump thing. No, it's not a Trump thing. It's an American thing. It's what we wanted for, for eight decades. This is when that became a Trump thing. Um, and that became a problem. Then Biden woke up one day and said, like, oh, I don't have any accomplishments. Let me go back and try to, like, make the whole Abraham Accord mine. And that came at a time where it, the whole thing, I mean, the, the, the continuity of the whole thing has been interrupted. 
um, obviously Biden wasn't that popular anymore in that region, according to anybody, everybody involved. And it became very difficult to restore the Arab Accords. Now, we can go back and fix that in the future, obviously, especially with the administration changes, especially if Trump comes back. But the whole idea is what we have with the Accords, which is a piece of paper signed saying like, hey, we're not going to fight each other. And we're going to start launching some programs, some co collaboration, some cooperation. It's all great. But that needs to be built on continuously. Not, and even before we talk about expanding it to new countries, it needs to be the success story, um, social success story, economic success story, cultural success story, political success story, uh, military success story. Um, uh, security and uh, success story. All these things we want the Abraham Accords to be, they need to be before we, uh, we need a, a clear, successful model. Then we can go around and expanding the Abraham Accords. And honestly, the, the other thing is nobody should get incentives for peace. Peace is good. Peace should not be incentivized, whatever country it is. You know, if that peace leads to better cooperation on energy, on, on security, on defense, sure. But the whole, like, tit for tat thing with a peace agreement, I, I don't like it. It's, it's not, it, it, yeah, it doesn't smell right. It's, it, it demeans the whole process in a way. Interesting. So we'll wrap it up with this question. What trends do you think shape the relations between the U.S. and the Middle East over the next time? Your, your mic was cutting in and out. Oh. I don't know if you're oh. far from the mic. Apologies. Yeah. What trends do you believe will shape the relations between the U.S. and the Middle East over the next 10 years? And where do you see the region forming? Again, that, that is like we, we're in a fork in the road. Do we continue to be reactive? Uh, and in that way, you know, honestly, the actions of actors in that region will dictate what we do. Or do we start being proactive and kind of restore that dream of a better Middle East, a peaceful Middle East, a prosperous Middle East? You know, a dream that was shared by so many presidents, you know. Even you know, more recently, uh, Bush and Obama shared that uh, goal. Trust me, even after 9-11, that's what we always wanted. You know, we had different approaches, we had different ideas, but the U.S. always has this dream of a peaceful and prosperous Middle East where, you know, Muslims, Christians, Jews live next to each other. They build economies. They, you know, continue building a, in their ancient civilization into in the future. That's what we've always wanted. And that's what everybody seems to agree on, you know, on, 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 on broad strokes. Um, so if we are going to, uh, you know, honestly, I, I think there's so much interest, political interest in that region, because it's like one of those, it's like the final boss of, uh, uh, of international politics. It's like so, such complexities. Uh, you know, un unfinished wars that are thousands of years in the making. Um, I think the U.S. would be happy to help. But we're not, we are not responsible for reforming a region of 400 million people. I think the people of that region need to reach that point or that decision that, you know what, we are going to move forward. And the U.S. will come and support that. And we will, we will work with that especially on uh, the economy, technology, um, you know, the things we're good at, technically. But the whole idea of we're going to come and fix your uh, millennia of wars and millennia of conflict uh, by deploying a few troops and a few tanks, hey, that, that did not work. That's not going to work. We, we cannot try that again. So, what I'm, you know, what I said earlier, you know, opportunity and challenges. Obviously, if there's, you know, mass killings in the region in a mass war we're going to get involved one way or another but i prefer not to do that i prefer that we go and get involved behind an opportunity an opportunity for a better middle east 
but that opportunity needs to be created by the people of that region. Interesting. Uh, Mr. Al Khabra, I want to thank you for your time with us today. Uh, your insights were very interesting and insightful, and it was an honor having you as a thank guest. You. Or a figure thank of the you. week with the white All hat. Right. Thank you once again for having me.